I can't tell you how and when life began. That's unfortunate, because if we knew, then we'd have that bit of our history filled out, but instead we have no convincing record, neither tangible nor theoretical, of the earliest life. At least not yet. We don't have rocks from older than 4.03 billion years ago, and these rocks are extensively reworked by intense heat and pressure, so they would seem to have lost any fossils that might have once been within them. So our very oldest fossils are from even more recent than that, and the oldest unambiguous fossils that we have are of microbes that are already relatively well-developed, and therefore they've presumably seen hundreds of millions of years of evolution prior. So in order to get a sense of how life began, instead of turning to the oldest fossil, we're going to instead approach the issue somewhat more theoretically in this video. What is it that it took for the first life to be? The answer to that is we don't know, but it seems like all it took is four steps. And with these four steps, we leave a universe of chemistry and enter a planet where biology has begun. The four steps we need to accomplish are one, building the basic biomolecules that when combined in the right way make up the massive biomolecules that make up all the various components of cells, components like proteins and DNA. In the second step, these basic biomolecules are going to have to be combined to make the aforementioned massive biomolecules. Third, once we have this biomolecule, or maybe multiple biomolecules, we have to have either a biomolecule or a system of biomolecules that begins to self-replicate and evolve Darwinianly. And the fourth step would be making a membrane, some structure that contains the self-replicating molecule or molecules. So these self-replicating molecule or molecules would have made their home within this membrane or perhaps would have been born within this membrane. Before we go through the four steps, click or press the thumbs up button, ditto on the subscribe button, and support this channel if you'd like to bring it robustly into the future. Links in the description. Let's go. Okay, now let's consider these four steps. It's these four steps that we have to figure out to get ourselves from a world of dead molecules to alive ones. And the exact order of the steps isn't really clear. It seems reasonable that step one needs to precede step two because you need the basic biomolecules to make those macromolecules that are made up of those smaller biomolecules, right? That seems reasonable enough. And then step three of self-replication presumably only happens once one rather capable, relatively massive biomolecule comes into existence. But it also could theoretically require more than one biomolecule. It could be two or more biomolecules working in concert as is the case in life today, and that would mean that step two might actually have to happen multiple times and in different ways. In life today, DNA carries the information to make proteins, and proteins are required to build DNA. But if you can't have DNA without proteins, and you can't have proteins without DNA, then what you'd need is an early co-evolved system where numerous molecules worked symbiotically to create a self-replicating system. But most scientists think that the monumental unlikelihood of such a scenario points to a simpler, albeit more capable, in a deep way, single molecule. This molecule would have to be able to, one, have the information to build another one of itself, and also the capacity to build another one of itself. Whatever the true story is in our actual history, it's unclear at this point whether one or more than one massive biomolecule began our story of self-replication. So step three may have required more than one of step two. And step four, the membrane, can enter the picture whenever you want. You can add it in the beginning, and then the biomolecules would have to have assembled within the membrane somehow, and that raises a lot of complications. Or you can add it at any point along the process up to the very end, such that a self-replicating molecular system that is evolving Darwinianly then finds itself within a membrane and the story would go from there. We're going to mostly avoid the ambiguity these possibilities raise, and instead just take a broad look at these four steps. Step 1. Making basic biomolecules. Making basic biomolecules, those components of the larger biomolecules that make up our cells, that step's the most understood part of the origin of life. It turns out that biomolecules are a lot more abundant than was once presumed. To trace this concept, let's consider the world of proteins. Proteins are composed of many amino acids linked up to one another. So when considering this first step of making the biomolecules that make proteins, we're going to look to make those amino acids. Similarly, we'd be looking to make the component parts of all the other base parts of life. Human beings began building these parts in 1953 with an experiment by Stanley Miller and Harold Urey. 
The basic idea was that the early atmosphere may have had the right atoms and molecules within it, such that when lightning struck, or even as high energy radiation came from the sun, they would begin to react accordingly with the extra energy catalyzing reactions and building up basic biomolecules. Water, which is so crucial in almost all paradigms of life, would be continually added and then drained from the atmosphere. What they did was have water sit at the bottom of the experiment where it simulated the oceans and it was heated to evaporate. It would then cool in the atmosphere and mix with all the gases that were there simulating the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, it would be exposed to electric sparks simulating lightning. It would then cool down, condense, falling down into that tiny ocean. The idea is, in the early history of Earth, these biomolecules would be falling into the ocean and into other bodies of water. And from there on, the next steps of life of building them up, getting self-replication and a membrane would have to take place. So in the experiment, they repeated this process of evaporation and electrical stimulation and condensation over and over and over. And the first time they ran the experiment, the black muck began to build up at the electrodes and glycine, life's simplest amino acid, was found. And the second time, they let it run longer. And over five days, the muck reappeared and the water went to yellow, which it had done the first time as well. And then in the second run, it went to pink and then to red. And this time, many more biomolecules were produced, including half a dozen important amino acids. These Miller-Urey experiments were repeated in different forms until almost all biomolecules had been created, including sugars and other carbohydrates, amino acids, hydrocarbons, and metabolic acids. Furthermore, as the experiments advanced, we moved on from the initial atmosphere that Miller and Urey used that was composed of methane, ammonia, and hydrogen, and we've moved to atmospheres that better reflect our understanding of the actual atmosphere of the early Earth. But even with those further experiments, there were some basic biomolecules that hadn't been created, including adenine, guanine, and ribose. But a next series of experiments were run that used concentrations of molecules that were the results of these various Miller-Urey experiments, and then they would just use a concentration of specific molecules that were results from those experiments, and in experiments conducted with those concentrations, they were able to create adenine, guanine, and ribose. However, one class of molecules that remains not well represented in these Miller-Urey processes are lipids, which are the fatty molecules that make up almost all cell membranes. But there are other ways of getting basic biomolecules than through reactions in the atmosphere. That includes hydrothermal vents in the ocean, which are seen by many as more attractive than the small volcanic pond scenario that Darwin and the Miller-Urey camp envisioned as the actual location for the first life forms. It turns out that hydrothermal vents do produce many biomolecules, but they also break many of them down as well. The same energy source that can be used to catalyze a reaction to build a molecule can be strong enough to force a molecule apart to break that molecule down. The breakdown of biomolecules is a general problem with atmospheric creation as well, where many of them break down, especially when exposed to ultraviolet radiation. Beyond hydrothermal vents, another source of biomolecules that bears mentioning is the heavens. As amino acids and possibly other biomolecules arrive on some carbonaceous meteorites that land here, which means that some biomolecules were presumably falling to Earth early on in the form of carbonaceous meteorites as well. It's further theorized that as planets are formed in the environs of their host stars, the clouds that form both the star and the planets, those clouds have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen, theoretically reacting together to build biomolecules that would litter the early Earth as Earth was hardening and the detritus of space was continuing to fall upon her. So we can get a lot of biomolecules, but how do we build them up? And that brings us to step two. How do we build them up to the macromolecules that would be required to make up actual life? Building up life's macromolecules is not a simple thing. The basic biomolecules that we found, as well as the ones that we've created in experiments, are way more varied than the ones that life in particular uses. That is, life is very selective with the biomolecules that it uses. So not only do we need to somehow get all of these molecules together into longer and longer chains, but we also need to connect just the right ones to each other. There has to be a massive selection process that's happening here because there are tons of biomolecules, much more than life makes use of. So it's clear that we need to have some process of selection happening. In order to get this process started, we'd probably need a relatively protected environment where energy sources aren't tearing apart molecules all over the place. So if these larger molecules are arising in water, it might have done so in an area shaded by rocks. 
protected from the radiation of the sun. And if these molecules built up underneath the water, more in accordance with the hydrothermal vent theorists, then perhaps it happened near one of the white smokers, which are less energetic than the more well-known black smokers. But even in such a location, there remains a problem. It's difficult to reason that life could have arisen by biomolecules colliding randomly, whether it was near the surface shaded by a rocky outcrop or underwater near a soft white smoker. Even if all the sources we know of for producing biomolecules were doing so abundantly, they wouldn't amount to close to enough to make the water any more than having a very dilute amount of biomolecules within it. So it would seem that we need even more of a selection method. We not only need something to select the right biomolecules, we will need something that collects biomolecules together to help them to concentrate in such a manner that either directly or indirectly leads to their coming together to form macromolecules. What could have done that? Unfortunately, the answer to that is that step two is just not filled out. We don't know how these biomolecules were selected and concentrated. But one alluring idea is that rocks might be the key players here. It seems very reasonable in a way. I mean, what else exactly is there? There's water, there's the atmosphere, and then there's the rocky surface above and beneath the water. That rocky surface beneath the water may have some tricks up its sleeve. The idea is that certain minerals and rocks would select and maybe even arrange through their crystal structure specific biomolecules and line them up and provide a safe environment for them to hang out for the duration. This safe environment would give the chance for time to play its role and build up these structures. This idea is attractive in a way. For one, the charged surfaces of minerals would obviously interact with certain biomolecules and pull them in. In fact, protein-like structures have been built up from amino acids in solution with minerals, and those minerals help to bring out the construction of these larger structures. One of the problems with these studies is that the larger a molecule grows, the more strongly it sticks to its host mineral and it's hard to see how a molecule stuck to a rock can take the necessary steps to become life. However the building of biomolecules was done, we're clearly far from understanding that story. So let's move on to step three. Step three is self-replication. And the basic idea here is how do we create a self-replicating cycle of molecules that is evolving Darwinianly? Once again, I'm relegated to relaying that we don't know. But at least over here, there's a theory that's favored widely amongst the scientists in the field. The idea is that some form of RNA would have been the first self-replicating molecule getting life going. One of the problems of the origins of life is that the process that life currently uses to reproduce requires two distinct components, namely proteins and DNA. The DNA has the information to make more of the life form, but in order to build DNA, you need proteins. So it's a chicken and egg problem. What came first? The protein, which requires the code of the DNA to be properly built, or the DNA, which requires the proteins to even be assembled? The answer is, of course, maybe, RNA. In the 1980s, it was discovered that some segments of RNA, heretofore seemingly just another form of genetic material that aided in a number of cellular functions, well, it was discovered that RNA was much more than that and that some segments catalyze biochemical reactions helping to build up bigger molecules. That's the kind of work that proteins do. So if some form of RNA could provide the information to produce new forms of itself, which it can then use and catalyze the reactions to build itself anew, then we have an answer to the chicken and egg question of origins. If this is true, there was a time prior to DNA being the dominant genetic story of life and said RNA was running the show alone. But perhaps it's not true. And if it's not true, perhaps we'll come to know the truth in the future. But for now, let's move to step four, making a membrane. Making a membrane turns out not to be that hard. Sort of. David Diemer and his team showed over 25 years ago that it's very easy for nature to naturally make something similar to a cell membrane, a lipid vesicle. These lipid vesicles form spontaneously when certain compounds are in water that have hydrophobic and hydrophilic ends. To reach a more stable state, the hydrophilic ends align towards the water and the hydrophobic ends come together to avoid as much water as possible, which they avoid even further water and reach an ever more stable state by forming spheres and having the hydrophobes avoid the most possible water. So some lipids do this spontaneously, forming these lipid vesicles, and lipids are thought to have fallen from space quite a lot early on. These vesicles have also been shown to easily incorporate many biomolecules as well. So many biomolecules wouldn't have found it hard to enter into this 
protomembrane. But there's the rub, protomembrane, maybe. Because a lipid bilayer is just not a cell membrane. Cell membranes are far more complicated. They have a means of regulating what comes in and goes out of the cell. That means are protein receptors that are embedded inside them. But without those protein receptors, what good is a lipid bilayer? That would just seem to close off a cell from any food and therefore capacity for growth and reproduction. Unless, of course, the first cells made their own food, which is a story for another time. That's the story. We've got four steps in the making of life, and we've yet to make life or get clear on how it's made. But the story may be something like this. Biomolecules were created abundantly in the atmosphere and in energetic regions on their water. More still fell to Earth in asteroidal form. And in some area, perhaps near a white smoker, particular biomolecules assembled, building up to some more complicated stage. It's hard to see exactly where this mineral story can take us, and difficult to imagine that it can take us all the way to RNA. So with a scratch of the tape at this point, we move on and into RNA world, the hypothetical early world of loose strands of RNA either having come to be or making its way into a membrane of sorts. That's the gist of it, possibly. Until forever then, let's attempt to peer deeper into this mystery of the origins of life and all other mysteries.